around improving the quality of medical care and establishing standards of excellence in medical education, and then really assessing throughout their career the, the, the fitness of specialists in family medicine, fitness to practice, and it has that underlying responsibility to the public of protecting their, their health and their interests. Courtney, if you could go to the next slide. And so that, what that means is that there's a recertification process that family physicians have to go through. And in fact, ABFM was the first board to require that periodic recertification. So there's no time unlimited certificates or, or grandfathers, as they sometimes call them. Um, and then about a decade ago, we been, began phasing in what's called maintenance of certification, which means you're not just taking a test every seven to ten years, you're actually going through a, a process of evaluating your own care and then doing quality improvement and repeating that cycle with some frequency. If you go to the next slide, Courtney. And so now we have all of our diplomates in this 10-year cycle of testing, but every three years they have to go through stages of uh, recertification um, that include that self-assessment and then practice assessment and quality improvement, which means they have to do a practice improvement module every three years. And so that gives us an opportunity to, to create tools for them to not only evaluate their practice and their practice population, but to actually do some specific things to try and improve outcomes. The next slide, Courtney. And family medicine, uh, you know, thank in, thanks in large part to the, the Affordable Care Act and then prior to it, other efforts to increase the uptake of electronic health records and practice. Uh, we knew as of 2011 that about 70% of family physicians had an electronic health record, and, and it's probably closer to 80% now. The problem is that most of them, despite the fact that they spend lots of time putting data into EHRs, don't have a mechanism for getting information out. And so the next slide, Courtney. So we're actually take, undertaking several projects, and. They're in parallel now, but they'll come together, and I hope you'll see that when I'm finished in just a minute. But the first effort is, is this trademark. It's the trial of aggregate data exchange for maintenance of certification and raising quality. And that's a partnership with Kaiser Permanente of Colorado and Ocean out of Oregon and Group Health of Puget Sound, as well as a group out of Southeast Texas, where they're already measuring quality, but we have this maintenance of certification process where they have to also come in and report to us quality measures on some group of patients. And what we're going to be testing with them is can they, can their institution send us their whole panel quality measures, uh, and then we, we're going to test how we present those measures back to them, how we compare them to their peers, and see whether it has an impact on their choices for quality improvement projects and whether it moves their quality further than it would have. And this is a funded collaboration with AHRQ. The next slide, Courtney. But we recognize that most of those family docs can't get measures out of their EHRs. And so we're also developing a family medicine registry. Uh, we call this DACRI, or the Data Abstraction and Intelligence Quality Engine for Research and Improvement, where we actually are going to give them a tool that pulls the data out of their EHR runs it through a quality measure engine, hands it back to them at the patient level so that they have something to make decisions at point of care, and then they have the opportunity to send data, aggregate data, wherever they want to, whether that's to us for maintenance of certification or to PQRS and uh, for, uh, to CMS for PQRS payments or for meaningful use payments. But it gives them a lot more control of their data and it lets them produce information from it. And we're actually going to launch that in the spring of 2015 with a pilot uh, with a group who's now done this for ophthalmology and urology and uh, have done it quite effectively. And what that sets us up for is the next slide, Courtney, is that we can actually give them additional tools. And so that's where the population health assessment tool comes into play because we can take the clinical data that they have and actually turn it into population health information. We can show them their service area. We can show them how deeply they're penetrating neighborhoods. We can allow them to do hot spotting, whether that's of disease or quality. And we can also hand them back a 
what we call a community vital sign. That is, uh, what is the, this patient, you know, you have blood pressure, you have pulse rate, but what is this patient's relative risk of dying early, having early mortality? Or what's this patient's risk of not finishing high school? What's this patient's risk of having a teen pregnancy? Uh, it's taking the social determinant data of their neighborhood, and uh, because we've we've worked empirically with those data in the past to come up with these estimates at a neighborhood level, we can actually create a vital sign based on the social determinant data that, help, again, helps the physician make decisions with this patient in front of them uh, based on their neighborhood characteristics. And so that's the tool that we want to give back to them, and, and our hope is that it will empower family physicians as leaders of community health assessments and help them think about how they can improve health without uh, being dependent on what they can actually just do in, the, in their clinical um, enterprise. And it actually, I think, will enable them to be better partners with public health. Courtney, the next slide. And we're proposing to build this off of a tool that we uh, developed for community health centers called the UDS Mapper that takes their patient data from 24 million patients a year and puts it into a tool to do uh, many of the things that we want to do with family physicians' clinical data. Next slide, Courtney. So what I'm showing you here is for Unity Health System in, in the District of Columbia, it's demonstrating their service area. So the geographies that, that they touch and that make up 70% of their market, and the depth of green indicates their depth of penetration of the population there. Uh, for health centers, you can actually flip it and look at the unserved population that aren't touching the health center but that are eligible based on their socio-demographic data. And so this is the kind of tool that we want to turn on for family physicians. The next one, Courtney. And then we can also pull social determinant data in here. So what I've got mapped here is percent of population below 100% poverty by, by zip code, uh, percent unemployed. Uh, 25 to 100 percent, and then percent of the population uninsured. Um, we put the uninsurance into the UDS mapper so that we could help health centers become agents of um, helping people find insurance either through exchanges or through Medicaid expansion. So we, we've, the tool we built for health centers won't solve all of the problems that we want to for family docs, but it's a very good start and it has a lot of the right data elements in it already. Courtney, the next slide. And this came straight out of the IOM report. Uh, one of the recommendations there was to, to work together, this was specifically speaking to CDC and HRSA, to undertake an inventory of existing health and healthcare databases and to identify new ones, and then from those create a consolidated platform for sharing and displaying local population health data that could be used by communities. Um, I know because I wrote this, this recommendation. And uh, so what we're trying to do is actually create that platform with FPs in mind specifically, but eventually uh, allowing them to pull data in from multiple other sources based on how they want to work with their community. And we know it's also not enough just to turn on a tool, so that means we also have to develop the uh, practice performance modules that actually assist them in how they can use the tool and then just like the UDS mapper is to build out a, like a consult service, someone that you can call and be trained on how to use the tool and who can actually guide you through specific use cases. So those are our goals, and um, we've partnered with ARC. We're talking with Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. And then the ABFM Foundation um, has committed to putting considerable resources into building this out over the next three years. And... Uh, if the, if the ophthalmology registry is any indication, half of their membership came in between March and June of last year. So we're hoping that there's enough value embedded in joining this registry that we'll get family physicians in and, um, and then try and get them to use this tool specifically to be agents of community health and partners to, popul to uh, public health. Yumi, I, I know you, had, you gave me 10 minutes, but I'm trying to be faithful to that, and I think... Um, yeah, thank you, Courtney. So that, I think this is my last slide. Um, that, that really is, we're making a, a concerted effort and contribution to this um, 
again, as I said, we need to make this valuable to physicians. Uh, we need, it needs patient and population hooks. It needs something that helps them engage at a community level. It needs incentives and maintenance certification is one of them. It needs facilitation and education and that's why we've planned to build out those pieces of the tool. And then frankly, it needs partnerships and data alignment so that um, because we think HRSA, uh, just as they've done with the UDS mapper, will find value in this uh, in looking at access around the country. We think CDC, that it will be useful in terms of community health needs assessments, that they're helping IRS write the regulations for hospitals because now you'll have uh, the coverage from uh, primary care doctors in the community. And then uh, for payers, because it, it's, act it's a tool that's supposed to help physicians um, make an even a bigger impact on population health outcomes, which is where we're really going. So I'd, I'd love feedback, I'd love questions, um, I'd, I'd love opportunities from this group to think about partnerships, and I will stop there. Well, thank you, Bob. We, let's open it up for questions if you can stay on. <laughs> sure thing. Um, this is Mary Patterson from AAC and, and asking the obvious question. Um, this would be an incredibly important thing for our nurse practitioner uh, schools to learn about, for nurse practitioners to learn about. Have you thought about reaching out to uh, nursing? We sure have, absolutely. Um, and we know 60% of our diplomates work with nurse practitioners or PAs. So yeah, there's no exclusion here. Um, we've talked first with uh, pediatricians and internists about their interests, but I would, I would love to open that conversation with nursing. Uh, AACN would be very interested in having that conversation, so maybe we can uh, uh, get a link up going at, you know, offline. Absolutely. Hey, yeah, Merle Cunningham here. May I ask a question? Hi, Bob. Merle here. Hi, Merle. Uh, we have a community health center world and the FQHCs nationally um, and working with NAC, we've been learning more about all of the complexity of having uh, data sets move from one EMR product to another or into a central or regional uh, database or regional data warehouse. What, what is the strategy about how, in, how to integrate material coming in from so many different products? I'm sure that the, the, the folks in private practice have multiple products way beyond that of uh, the FQHCs, which is about eight or ten basic ones. But what, what is the strategy on that? That seems like an incredible challenge for interoperability. Oh, it is an incredible challenge, and it's why a lot of EHRs are struggling with meaningful use two and even three. Um, it, it's a, I think it's, it's fair to say it's a big problem in private practice. Um, I know OCHIN, which used to be Oregon Community Health Information Network, but really now is in 15 states and mostly FQHCs, is tackling that problem by moving most of their folks, frankly, to EPIC uh, or to getting those FQHCs into health information exchanges. Um, but they're working very hard to integrate those data flows for FQHCs. Um, most of the outpatient world is trying to solve that problem by joining health systems or or being pulled into hospital systems so that they're all on the same platform. Uh, some of the innovative HIEs, like out of uh, Cincinnati, is trying to do it through data exchanges at the health in information exchange level. But I don't think there's any, there are lots of, of good small solutions happening. I don't know that there's a good large solution yet. Yeah, I don't, I don't think there will be. I think there are going to be lots of different regional ones, which makes it obviously complex, <laughs> even within a state and then within whatever the states end up with eventually, but obviously huge challenge, critically Absolutely. needed, but huge challenge. It is. One of the reasons we went with the vendor we did on the on Daiquiri, on the registry development, is that they're able to do cloud-based EHR polls as well. And so that's one of the things we'll be definitely testing in the spring. And this is Ted Wimson, Ohio. So with our community health centers here, we're working with OCHIN, you know, for uh, data aggregation, and they're now uh, linking up with our next gen practices also. So they're pulling next gen into their capacity. At least they're developing that now. So they're trying to expand their capability. But you know, I think this is a great effort. I mean, I think at the FQAC level, we would certainly welcome this population health addition to our 
armamentarian for uh, doing patient care, and just had this conversation yesterday here uh, in the Columbus area on how we could import public health data into what we already have as some um, uh, formats that we can uh, accept it. And I just got a link with public health now and be able to pull their public health capacity into my clinical practices and you, you get it in a usable format. Ted, thanks for that. And the, I'm glad to hear that you're, the Ohio FQHCs are part of OCHIN. Um, you know, under their PCORI grant, OCHIN is actually t uh, doing a small pilot of this community vital sign concept. And so we're, because they're a partner with us already, we're, we're hoping to learn from them about um, both how they do that and then what its utility is. So y your health centers might be part of that pilot. Probably so. So my next step out is to public health, to the Department of Health at state level, to begin right. connecting and importing their data into our platform that we're developing so that it can be blended in a way that's useful to clinicians so it's not toggling back and forth between public health information and their clinical data that they have, but instead having those uh, real-time be available to the clinician in the exam room. Oh, that's a great idea. Yeah. I, I hope you'll talk with Jen DeVoe at OCHIN about that. I, they may have some, uh, some real interest in developing that with you. I will, yeah, this is from a yesterday meeting, so I will carry it straight forward, but I really applaud your effort. I think this is moving in exactly the right direction. Well, thank you. Um, Bob, this is Denise. I have a question. Hi, Denise. Denise. Hi. You know, as I'm watching this again, and thank you, I'm, I'm glad I was able to get on. One other thing, and this is fantastic, and I think it's so important for the physicians to see see it, and, and some of the database sources that you may be pulling in may, may not be on other sources like the community commons and the target area intervention tool. And, and one of the questions that I struggle with is when we do this, how do we do this so that we're not doing it in silos? Because I'm looking, I'm thinking and looking and, and seeing the parallels to what you just demonstrated or, to, or showed in the slides and the um, tools that are on the Community Commons website that is also freely available. And one of the gaps that people, the hospitals had said to us is that they want a way to upload their own clinical data. Um, and then Kaiser is interested in assessing, you know, what kinds of tools are out there, are they useful for people? And they keep asking me, well, how do we do this so that we are more integrated in our tools? And I wonder what you think about that. And, and, you know, part of me says, well, gee, let's at least have each of our us appeal to different constituencies so at least get them thinking this way. But then the other question is, is there a way we can do it so that we're doing it together, um, and what's on the community commons is a way to print out reports about what's in the um, geographic area you want to focus on. Well, thank you so much for that question, Denise. I, I was actually at NCVHS yesterday with Chris Fulcher and others talking about this data alignment issue. Um, I think, because Chris runs the uh, yep. community commons. Perfect, and, perfect. And so we're we're actively thinking about that, how we can create alignment of those data sources so that, as Ted said, you're not flipping back and forth between public health or community health tools and clinical health tools. Yeah. Um, I don't I don't have a great answer yet, but I, I can tell you we're talking about it, and I think we're going to need some real um, in vivo testing because yeah. uh, our, our real risk is overwhelming clinicians with too much. Mm -hmm. too much no, that's perfect. Layers. No. Good. Well, I'm glad you, you and Chris Fulcher are connected because that's exactly. And, and, yeah, it may be. I mean, just like we have, you know, bazillion tools out there. We've got, the, I mean, for public health and primary care to work together, we've got the playbook, we've got the action center, we've got this. Sometimes maybe it's helpful for different tools to speak to a certain audience and try to drive us all together. And I don't know what the answer w will be, but um, keeping in touch is, I think, helpful. <laughs> Thanks. Well, I'll tell you, one of the things we landed on yesterday was the, uh, if there's a, you might have to, you might need to have a, a, a big need use case that, that gets the data sets lined up so that they can be used for other purposes. And we, we specifically talked yesterday about community health needs assessment is one. And another potential use case is around a shortage designation, so HIPSA, MUA, MUP designation, where you, 
really can benefit from having clinical and public health data sets up and aligned so that they are feeding specific tools and needs. And then because you have the alignment set up, then you can have other purposes that are drawing off of them specific data elements. And um, that's where we left the conversation in CVH yesterday, so I don't know if it will turn into anything, but we're certainly talking about it. Great. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Bob, this is Don Bradley. Um, I'm at Duke at this point, although I recently retired as the Senior Vice President for Healthcare at Blue Cross Blue Shield of North Carolina. Um, there are a couple things that come to mind. One is providing the tool um, without really the underlying skills and knowledge, I think will be, uh, these need to be well coordinated and, and really plowing the road before the, the data gets out there would be um, one thing that I think is important. Um, the second question, and as mentioned just now, the you know practical playbook is certainly one way that can help with that. The second is how are the maps that you showed a a count or are they a rate of uh, issues and, and how do you really know that you've got the right denominator uh, or at least a robust picture of what the population looks like with this tool? That's a great question uh, and uh, they can be – let me start with your first – the first point. Um, I've actually been talking with Lloyd Mishner about about the potential to develop specific modules that guide physicians through the use of these data um, and that are tested then with physicians to make sure that they are effective. So doing some road plowing before we launch it. Um, I'd welcome other ideas in that regard. To your second question is that they can be rates or numbers. What I displayed were rates and the denominators are drawn from both the ACS, the American Community Survey, uh, and from census data, uh, where we worked with HRSA over the last three years to really, and, and with NCHS, to try and make sure that we're using as good, as good uh, of local um, geographic data as we can. Um, I'll tell you, it has some fallacies. Like if you, if you flip it and you look at the percent of the population eligible for FQH services that are not using it, who aren't showing up, um, the rural health clinics immediately get upset if you're looking out in rural areas because they say, hey, we're taking care of some of those people too. So um, there are risks in that, but uh, we, we've really tried to educate people about those risks so that they don't overestimate or underestimate what the tools are trying to display. Okay. Um, so I, I would say, number one, this is a fantastic uh, project and process. Uh, we've worked in North Carolina actually for North Carolina Health Quality Alliance to actually pull together Medicare, Medicaid, and then private payer data um, to do some mapping similar to this on a county by county basis. And right. it is very difficult. I think the, the one virtue we've had is we've been able to represent about 65 to 70 percent of the population. Um, so it's not just the public health population, it's a, it's a broader population. So. Well, you guys have been leaders in that, so I, I would welcome a chance to learn from that. So, and then in terms of what you see as the payers' roles um, with this project? Yeah, my, my thought there is that, is that they're interested in, um, I know that they're interested in hot spotting because they're doing it. Um, I know they're interested in trying to use that hotspotting to drive um, clinical and community behavior. So, you know, focusing resources on areas where their costs are the highest and trying to figure out does that community need social workers, do they need health coaches, do they need, are there things that we can do that affect health that are not in the healthcare arena? And so my goal here is to say, well, physicians and nurses and PAs and clinics can be part of that process. Um, and, the, and the idea of community-oriented primary care, and the payers may see this as an opportunity to partner with, with those clinical entities to be partners in the community. Okay. And, 
under, 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 like under an accountable care organization model, um, you would want tools like this to maximize your impact on the population health outcomes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I may just try to catch up with you offline a little bit more about that. Okay. Great. Are there any last questions for Bob? Merle Cunningham, a quickie, Bob. Uh, have you connected with any of the Beacon projects that have just finished a three-year uh, period out there? I think there's uh, 11 or 12 in the country. Several of them have regional, have have worked specifically on regional data sets with all of the payers in in some parts of the of the country, specifically, uh, you know, around this thing. Many have involved private practices, but have you had any opportunity to connect with any of the folks from the Beacon projects? So I've talked. That's a great question, Merle. I've talked with um, Craig Bramer from Cincinnati, where they have, like I said, one of the best HIEs in the country, but they also are a Beacon community. Um, and I've talked to Bob Graham, who oversaw most of that work for RWJ at least recently. Um, but it's, it's very superficial touches for both of those. And now I, I need to go back and do some more depth touch to see how we can collaborate with them. Well, just in case you haven't connected, I can send you the, the, the contact person there. there ha there's a national evaluation of all the beacons that's nearing completion now that's been done uh, through, uh, through uh, you know, the National Office of National Coordinator. But unfortunately, uh, they weren't all standardized in the beginning, and people were funded to do whatever they thought they could do in the, in the regional area. So it's, it's, it's quite variable, but they're, they're, it, it's worth exploring because there's – there may be some good ideas in some of those places, even though they aren't standardized. Well, Merle, if you have, uh, I'd love to connect with you offline to, to talk sure. about which ones we should approach. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Bob, this is Yumi. Did you say that both um, pediat pediatrics and internal medicine are going to collaborate with you? Uh, what I've said is we've talked with both of them extensively about these tools. Um, the American Board of Pediatrics has had the most interest, and they're kind of waiting to see how these pilots go. Mm -hmm. um, the American Board of Internal Medicine, I, don't, I certainly don't want to speak for them, but I, I think they're, they're taking the long view of really waiting to see how these go um, mm -hmm. because I think they've made efforts to do similar things in the past and, and found them to be very expensive and not quite as effective as they'd hoped. Oh. Um, but we're, we're going to keep them close in the loop. Great. Well, thank you so much. I really applaud you for this effort. It's, it's fantastic. And thanks for stepping out of your clinical care to present to us. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for being so generous with time. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thanks. Uh -huh. um, Donna, I'm going to let you take over. Thanks, Yumi, and thanks, Bob. That was a terrific presentation. And thanks, everybody, being here. You may recall a few months back on this call we talked about um, our desire to make sure that the Framing the Future effort that I've been privileged to lead for the past three years included as part of the, spe the spectrum of education and public health that we included some statement about the, the, the existing workforce because most of the work of the Framing the Future expert panels had been focused on preparation for people for the workforce. So our degree programs at the doctoral, master's, four-year, two-year, um, re speak to the pr preparation of the workforce, and we wanted to make sure we didn't ignore the needs of those people who are in the workforce who may or may not have had prior, prior training. So with the support of this group and our colleagues at ASTO, we put together one last expert panel under the Framing the Future umbrella to look at, at that issue. And we, we tried to circumscribe it and keep it, keep, keep it focused to what accredited schools and programs of public health could do, because obviously there are lots of people out there who can and do provide training to the workforce, but we thought it was, it was our job to only speak to um, our world through ASPPH. So that was one sort of framing, um, framing issue. And the other was we tried to say, well, we feel we have a particular responsibility to the workforce that exists within, within the, the public health uh, agency structure, so the state the state health department structure, the local health department structure. And uh, we, we started there. We had, we had good discussion on, on both of those points. We also agreed to follow the, the, um, the organizing structure that had been used by the, by the NPH expert panel where the group identified key considerations, which are those sort of overarching contextual issues that frame the discussion, and then design elements of what, what perhaps um, 
the training could 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 look like, what form it might take, and then and then critical content. So the draft that you were sent a day or so ago, um, and I hope you've had a chance to look at, it, is a draft. It's the first draft out of the committee. I know Paul Halverson's on the call, and I'm going to turn this over to him in a moment because he did an absolutely incredible job uh, leading this effort in, in short order. But I want to point out a couple of things before I do that. The first is that even though we said we wanted to only be focused on workforce development efforts of the workforce, it was difficult for us to not uh, frame that in the context of all the preparation we do for, for the workforce. So, so you'll, you'll see a sentence uh, in the preamble to that. And we also couldn't escape the fact that we always like to um, remind us collectively that the extent to which we have practice-related faculty and practice-related activities going on within schools and programs of public health, that just serves to strengthen the relationship between schools and programs of public health and the state and local agencies with, with which we work. So that's a statement that's in, the, that's in the preamble as well. And if you've had a chance to look at this, I'd welcome any comments. I, don't, I didn't expect them today. What I wanted to say uh, before I let Paul say a few words is that we are very interested in, 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 in your comments on this, on the overall approach we've taken and on the specifics. The group is continuing to work on this. Um, we're, we will be seeking input from other groups, but we wanted to start here because this is where this particular effort was born. Um, so if you don't, uh, there's no need for you to comment now unless you wish to. You can send comments to me or to Liz Weiss at ASPPH at any time um, in the next couple of weeks, please, if you can, because we are intending to get this wrapped up as we wrap up the entire Framing the Future effort, uh, hopefully by, by the end of the calendar year. So with that, Paul, would you like to say a few words? Paul, are, are you there? He may have left. Well, if not, are there uh, people have any general comments about this? Any thoughts? Any comments? Otherwise, uh, we'll just look forward to things that you may send in to us. I'm Merle Cunningham, a quickie. Uh, as I recall, uh, quite a few months ago, there was a conversation about the, the working group, and I believe uh, someone on the call asked about whether uh, you had had an opportunity to reach out to. Um, a missing uh, group, and that was the the folks that train the managers of health systems, the health systems management folks. They're not um, public health people, and they're not necessarily clinical leadership people, but obviously a critical part of what's needed for the future in terms of um, learning together, since they're the managers of many of the health systems that everybody lives with. What What's the current status of working or reaching out to the Health Services Administration folks? Well, that's happening in a couple of places through the task force. Um, that issue is being addressed through the, um, I forget what we call it now, Population Health and All Professions group, um, I know. But, and certainly we had, um, we had health leaders on this, on this committee. We can certainly send this out to them in particular and ask about, you know, ask for their input on the workforce development side. That, that, that's a great suggestion. We can certainly do that. We also, this is Harrison Spencer, we also have them on the Employee Advisory Group and, and that group is also vetting every single report as well. Thanks, Harrison. I always forget about that. Thank you. Other thoughts, comments at this point? I'm impressed with how quickly you did this work, Donna, you and in, in the group, work group. Um, yeah, Paul, Paul and Terry Dwelly and the, the group, uh, it was a small group, but it worked, it worked quickly. And um, we, are, we are eager to get feedback on this. And again, we use, we use a process where you know, we'll get feedback from you, we'll get it from other colleagues, and we'll continue to, to have this reviewed in uh, increasingly larger circles, if you will, um, to make sure it's right. Great. Would you like to give a deadline for people to send their comments? Um, what's today? Where's my count? <laughs> uh, it would be terrific if we could have them um, before APHA, which I think is November 15th, 14th, or 15th. That, that would be terrific. Okay. So Courtney, can you make a note of that and we'll, we'll send another something out. But, great. I'll include that in a minute. Wonderful. Thank you. Any other comments? Questions? Okay. So
So um, I thought I would let people know that w one of the things that we wanted to do with the committee as well as have, um, you know, different people on the, the committee present, share information, um, was to get the message out at some of the larger meetings that we attend. And um, the Association of American Medical Colleges annual meeting is um, coming up on, in first week in November before APHA. And um, so we submitted something quite a while ago when, Denise, are you still on the call? Uh, I guess she's. Yeah, I, I'm okay. sort of half on the call, yes. <laughs> right, um, when Denise was co chairing. And so um, we'll be presenting something about the, the Primary Care Public Health Co ASTO supported collaborative. Sharon um, Moffitt is going to be doing that part. And then um, a little about our committee. Malika Fair from the AAMC is also presenting with us. And um, we'll, we'll share many different workforce initiatives, but how we on this committee and call um, sh learn about each other's initiatives. And she'll tell about some of the CDC, AAMC um, projects that are going on. So one thing that we're going to do um, at that meeting is have people share what their institutions are doing. Um, any types of workforce initiatives to promote the integration of primary care and public health. And um, Courtney's developed a, um, a paper form that we're going to distribute, but we'll also put it on our website. So um, we'll be asking all of you to contribute or to spread the word um, so that we can collect um, you know, what, what other people are doing and give people the opportunity to contact each other. Um, another thing that um, initiative that we are working on now that we've talked about for a long time is developing on our website a um, just links to educational resources and tools that may be helpful. And thank you to Denise um, and Malika who've already you know contributed. Um, documents that they've had. And so we'll, what we've done is collected different ones, but Mary, for example, the nursing, um, you know, your competencies, can you make sure that any of you, and Justine, I think for PAs, we don't, we're weak on any of the areas besides primary care, um, besides medicine and public health. So um, we have a list up here that on the slide that, um, Courtney just put up, um, we'd like to see um, anything about community health worker competencies for the, the integration and wanted to open it up to others. Are we forgetting any um, other groups? That's just here. Uh, pharmacists. Pharmacists? Yeah. Good idea. Do we, um, if, if you, I think if you know of any connections, can you either you know reach out or send them to Courtney, and we'll try to reach out. Um, sure, I don't have direct connections, but I can certainly get with uh, the PA Education Association and see who they work with. Okay, great. Uh, um, this is Mary. Also, maybe the Healthy People 2020 um, group, which has a set of competencies that I think might be helpful. Yes, and, and that we do have that on the list. They've just put out a, a new 2016 right. version. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think um, Laura Rudkin, are you still on the call? I actually joined a little bit late, but oh, I am here. Yes, and a APTR um, has that new version on their website. And we'll, what we're just doing is providing links to all of these resources. Great. You know, another thought might be to reach out to AUPHA, which is the Association of University Programs and Health Administration, because I think they have competencies as well, and it might be a way to start including them in the dialogue. Okay, great, great. And you know, this call is open to anybody, so if you know of um, people who could contribute, that would be, please let us know how to contact them. But that's great. I, I will try to do that. 
Okay. Um, I had one other announcement, if, unless there are any other comments about this, the resources. Um, that the American Journal of Preventive Medicine, I just received today a supplement um, on the public health workforce with guest editors Coronado, Ku, and Gebby. So congratulations, Denise, and it's, um, I look forward to looking at that. Thanks. <laughs> There's an article by Alonso Plow, of course, about the um, culture of health, and um, there's an article by another RWJF person about nursing, but a lot of it's talking about changes, and et cetera. But probably one of my last workforce-specific activities, <laughs> um, well, except for actually the legacy project with CDC Experience, which actually I, I should talk to you guys about at some point, getting on the agenda. Okay, great. Did anybody else have announcements? Hi, this is Jessica Pittman from CSTE. Um, I wanted to announce that we're opening the application for um, the Health Systems Integration Program Fellowships for um, state and local health departments to host um, fellows that have um, doctoral and two years general education and two years of experience or a master's with four years of experience in um, public health, and they're going to be working on um, systems integration for that linkage of um, public health and primary care. So if you're interested in learning about those applications, um, you can find more information on the website. It's shine, S-H-I-N-E, fellows.org. And we also are having a um, webinar tomorrow about successful applications. So get, I also have any other questions, you can email me, uh, Jessica Pittman, J, at J Pittman, P-I-T-T-M-A-N, uh, at cst.org. Jessica, could you send that information to Courtney and she'll put it in the minutes? Yep. Great. Um, any hi. other announcements? Yes, hi, this is Sarah Linda from HRSA, and I just wanted to let folks know in case um, that they hadn't that um, HRSA in cooperation with CDC has um, awarded to the National uh, Network of Public Health Institutes uh, a Grant slash cooperative, actually a cooperative agreement um, to run the National Coordinating Center for the um, 10 new regional public health training centers. And in fact, they're already in gear um, uh, working on some Ebola uh, information, uh, preparedness, you know, assessing what the public health workforce needs through the um, training centers. And uh, so anyway, we're just really, really happy to have them on board and, um, and you know, just re remember it's a terrific network that we can leverage um, for a workforce training issues. So that's it. Thanks. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks. Any others? Well, actually, this is Denise, as long as we're, we've got a few minutes here. I just wanted to let people know we are trying to um, transform some of the, the materials from our medical student fellowship in applied epidemiology as part of a legacy project that Pfizer is funding to make the materials that would be more generically available and useful to people. And the one we're starting with, um, because people seem to be very interested in it, is a case study on working with the communities to improve health. So a la what Bob started the call with, and we're getting a few people to help critique the case study, which starts as a case of gang violence, but we're thinking of making it more generic to perhaps solving problems working with the community in chronic diseases. And so we're going to have a call with some people who volunteered to help critique the case study with us. I think it's either this Friday or while folks are at AAMC. But if people are interested in seeing the case study and giving us some feedback on how to make it more generic and then maybe participating on the call, they could let me um, no, and the small work group. And I can send people more description of this case study if they're interested. De Denise, yeah, why don't you, um, could you send that to Courtney, the description? Sure. Okay, that'd be great. Um, Merle Cunningham, a quick, yeah? quickie. Uh, I was on part of the faculty of a two-day uh, leadership training institute that was done last week called Interprofessional Leadership and Workforce Development. 
Um, this was uh, a partnership. It was in Denver, a conference uh, that was uh, piggybacked on the a regional conference that's done every year uh, with the group called CHAMPS, which is the regional primary care association over all of the states in Region 8, and uh, Northwest Regional PCA, which is the regional group over all of the states in Region 10. This was a two-day leadership institute uh, working with those two groups and the Northwest Center for Public Health Practice uh, based in the School of Public Health at the University of Washington. Uh, the audience of about 50 people was about two-thirds health center, FQHC people, and a third from uh, state health departments uh, and county health departments from, from that area. Uh, I'd be pleased to uh, provide that information to Courtney uh, to, to send out. The materials from this will be posted on a website, and uh, there may be interest in looking at what the content was. This is the beginning of what will probably be a continuous uh, leadership training um, program together with the University of Washington um, and, and these regional primary care associations, and I'll probably be part of the ongoing faculty, and we have some uh, foundation support uh, for continuing this in the future, but it may be of interest for people to follow. Great. Thank you, Merle. If there are no other um, announcements or updates, we do have um, a change in our next call was scheduled for Christmas Eve, I think. So we will reschedule that for January 21st between 11.30 and 12.30 Eastern Time. And Courtney will send that out also. Okay. Well, thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.